Well, I, I thank you all for being on the line. It sounds like we've got a pretty good cross-section from, from around the state. Um, so thank you for, for giving me about a half an hour here to, to talk about uh, the pressing issue of the day, which is what our nation is facing right now. There probably isn't a more critical issue that is facing our country than finding a resolution to the fiscal cliff. We've got less than a month now to resolve this. The, the financial uncertainty that we're facing is probably as, as damaging as anything. It is damaging to our national economy, and if we don't quickly resolve it, I think it's going to have some real consequences for our state. We saw what happened the last time when we, when we went to, to the brink with the debt ceiling last summer. There were market disruptions. There was a downgrade of our credit, uh, certainly a loss of confidence on the part of the American people. But I think that this time the stakes are even higher. The magnitude, the timing, the composition of, of these fiscal issues that are hitting all at once creates economically and politically uh, a damaging um, a challenge for us. The fiscal cliff negotiations, I think it's fair to say, hit on every hot button political issue. Hits taxes, discretionary spending, mandatory spending, government borrowing, and probably the more fundamental question of what is the proper size and role of government. These have never been easy conversations. But because the stakes are so high and the time that we're operating in is so short, the negotiating process is even more complicated. Let's, let's talk initially about first step. If, if Congress takes no action to avert the fiscal cliff before the end of this year, what we're going to see is an estimated $600 billion, which is nearly 4 percent of our GDP, that will be extracted from the economy next year. That's $500 billion in tax increases, and then there's $100 billion in federal spending cuts. This is what we're referring to when we talk about sequestration. And if current tax rates are allowed to expire, Alaskans can expect to pay an additional $647 million in federal taxes next year. This averages out to about um, $1,749 per return. So it's significant. And then you look at our state's composition. Our heavy dependence on federal revenue makes our economy more, vu more vulnerable when we're talking about sequestration than perhaps other states. Back in 2010, uh, total federal spending on contracts, salaries, and wages accounted for roughly 13 percent of our state's economy. And because our federal employees makes up, make up such a large share of the Alaskan economy, these reductions I think we can expect will significantly impact our state's economy. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that failing to address this cliff will result in lost jobs, lower wages, negative growth, and, and a generally weakened Alaskan economy. In my mind, though, this is, this is a crisis of our own doing. We've got a $16 trillion national debt. We've had four straight years of trillion-dollar deficits. So it isn't news to anyone that we've got a spending problem in this country. And you can attempt to blame President Bush. You can attempt to blame President Obama. But assigning blame doesn't solve the problem. Whatever the circumstances that got us here, I see this crisis as an opportunity to finally in enact meaningful reforms. But this is a big problem, and it calls for big solutions. I think the good news for us is that there are um, solid proposals that are already out there. You have the Simpson-Bowles framework. Uh, that's just one of many examples. But every one of these plans that's out there suggests that there are changes in three areas, in discretionary spending, in taxes, and mandatory spending. Now, we simply cannot take revenue off the table, as some have suggested. So I am not opposed to having us talk about those of means paying more. But we've got to keep it into perspective. Economic growth is the best form of revenue, so let's be careful about how we define wealth. In Alaska, a family income of $250,000 has to cover some pretty high costs. And many in that bracket are small businesses that employ other Alaskans. So maybe, maybe we need to look at a higher threshold here. But 
simply raising taxes on the wealthiest in this country is not going to solve our spending problems. We need immediate action on real mandatory spending reforms if we're ever going to rein in federal spending. Without a comprehensive approach, we can't pay down our debts, we can't avoid the sequestration and, and address these expiring tax provisions. I think that we need to make as many of these decisions as we can now. Delaying only makes the impacts worse. The choices that we're going to be looking at next year are going to be the same ones that we're looking at now. So going over this cliff is not only unacceptable, in my view, it's economically irresponsible. We've got a lot of work ahead of us in these next few days. Uh, and as I, as I state, it's incumbent upon us to take on the difficult tasks and do the responsible thing. With that, I'm, I'm happy to field some questions about where we are in the process, uh, what's on the table, what's not on the table, what some of my uh, suggestions are.